الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا ان هدانا الله والصلاة والسلام على خير خلق ونور أرش أفضل الأنبياء والمرسلين حبيبنا وسيدنا وسندنا وشفيعنا ومولانا أبي القاسم محمد وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين المأسومين المظلومين أما بعد فقد قال الله سبحانه وتعالى في كتاب المجيد وقوله الحق وهو أستق الصادقين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الله اشترى من المؤمنين أنفسهم وأموالهم بأن لهم الجنة يقاتلون في سبيل الله ويقتلون ويقتلون وعدا علي حقا في التوراة والإنجيل والقرآن ومن أوفى بأهده من الله فاستبشروا ببيعكم الذي بايعتم به وذلك هو الفوز العظيم صدق الله العلي العظيم صلوات الله محمد وآل محمد All praise belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and I begin in his name that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has granted us the Quran and the Ahlul Bayt as the ropes to hold on to in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala completes his favor upon us and makes our religion perfect. The verse I recited is in Surah Tawbah and it's a very interesting verse um, and I'd like to share it because it really hits the point very clearly when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he says inna Allah ashtara min al mu'mineen Allah has bought has bought the life of the believers he has bought their souls in other words Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has bought imagine Allah is the owner of the universe how does he buy here it's that sacrifice the individual makes towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that those who have made a covenant with Allah and here of course this ayah let me translate it so that we know Surely Allah has, brought, uh, has bought of the believers their persons and their property for this, that they shall have the garden. They fight in Allah's way, so they slay and are slain. A promise which is binding in him in the Torah and the Injil and the Quran. And who is more faithful to his covenant than Allah? Rejoice therefore in the pledge which you have made, and that is the mighty achievement. Meaning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has bought the property in the soul of the believers. Now who are these people? You and I also can sell our souls for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay, Allah says, لَن تَنَالُ الْبِرَّ حَتَّى تُنْفِقُوا مِمَّا تُحِبُّونَ You will not achieve righteousness until you give. In other words, you sell yourself for something. You have to give for that which you love most. In other words, you, you must trade, as you want to call it. But here the trade for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the greatest trade in principle. That means when you and I gravitate just for the sake of Allah, and do everything in the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we will become successful. As you know, tonight is the last lecture, and I'd like to tie some of these subjects that I've touched, and hopefully even finish off the history a little bit, and I think also the famous sermon of Zainab alayhi salam, how she spoke to Yazid in the uh, palace uh, in, in Syria. I think it's important for you to hear what she said, because we hear the paraphrase, but I think if I recite a few of her uh, her statements, I think it's profound for you and I to take a lesson on how to rise against the enemies and how to be strong and firm. At the end of the day, as Muslims, we have to be firm believers. Our Iman needs to be firm. We need to have confidence. We need to have a level of security in ourselves that the pathway we have taken is the right pathway. A lot of my young brothers and sisters especially come to me and they say, brother, we have doubts about our religion. We have doubts about Allah. We have doubts about uh, uh, whether or not our school of thought is right, you know, between the different schools. I have a doubt whether God exists. I have a doubt whether Islam is right. I have a doubt this and I have a doubt about that. Especially some kids come to me and they say that we are so taught about science and science has become such a central force in our life that we are having a hard time accepting God because the system is like that. The system is developed in our societies today to distract us from that. It is designed to confuse us. And I must say, I went through the same problem. Growing up as a teenager, I had those doubts, serious doubts. 
to the point where I questioned the integrity of everything. And I said, is it true? Is it possible? Does God really exist? And if he does, do I, how do I know Islam is right? Maybe the other religions are right. And I embarked on a journey from my teenage years especially, because I was very inquisitive. I was always inquisitive. I wanted to know. I needed to know. I needed, and I needed some kind of a template to use that would guarantee me that when I go and study that, that I have done enough research in it to validate myself that yes, I'm in the right position. Just like a scientist. A scientist, when they study uh, the universe and they study their bodies or they study anything in the world of science, you have to have tools by which to study. There's a methodology in science. If you don't apply that method, then one would say your approach is flawed and what you may conclude could be flawed. And there's no guarantee after that that what you have concluded is right. As a result, it's extremely important for us to validate. Validate the tools. And there's a fitra in us. There's something in our hearts that's very, very clear for us to see those lenses. The whole event of Karbala, for example, what clarifies it? There's a group of people sitting on, the th on, the, on a throne claiming to be representatives of God, claiming to represent the messenger of Allah. Now we ask the question, why do I need a messenger? What's a prophet supposed to do when a prophet comes? Look, it's very simple. Look how shaitan plays with our minds. A prophet is supposed to guide us to the best of ways. Otherwise, we don't need prophets. Now, when you have scriptures that are supposed to be divine scriptures, where prophets are committing sins and making mistakes, the very basic fitra in our heart should say, I can't accept this. They say, but God allowed it. We said, look, if this God allows that, then I don't need to waste my time because I think I can do pretty good by myself. I don't need this God to guide me. Remember, when people ask us, why do you need religion? Tell them the moral prescription, which is the most important uh, uh, tool that you and I will ever have to survive and to succeed in life. The moral prescription cannot come from the human race. It's impossible. Morality, as I mentioned, is not visible in science. It's not. You can study all the science you want, be the best PhD in whatever. You cannot be a moralist in empirical science. You can deduce it from a philosophical angle. You can deduce it from what we call a theological angle, but it comes from within, where I spin what I see, and I say, ah, that's a good thing. Oh, this is beneficial. Oh, wow, I see such beauty out there. These are all spins that is our other half. There's a material half and a spiritual half. That other half in us is now spinning and giving value to something. In the world of science, it doesn't have it. So please, brothers and sisters, don't lose your faith and have it weakened. Because when our faith becomes weak, then shaitan plays havoc with us. Because then we have no reason to serve Allah. We have no reason to do things for Allah. Notice I started my lecture saying, what? Well, let's do things for Allah. Some of us saying, this Allah, I, I don't know him. How do I know him? How do I get it? I'm saying, think about it. Does the universe come by itself? Impossible. And there's a rational argument to that. Okay? There's a rational argument to why the universe is where it is. Because there's a basic premise that from nothing comes nothing. We are something. Therefore, nothing could not have made us. It's impossible. Whatever created us must be above us, greater than us, otherwise it can't make us. And we know that. That's a logical, rational, uh, systematic uh, proof. So when you go through rational arguments, you say, okay, and I see order, I see structure, I see emotions, and I see reasons, I see us holding each other liable for crimes we commit. Why? If we're all a product of an accident, why did this come into play? The other day somebody was saying to me that, we are taught in school that morals are a creation of mankind. People say that. One, one brother called me in school, he says, I'm, I'm, debate, I'm discussing with my atheist professor, and he's saying the moral system has been concocted by mankind. And this poor kid didn't know how to answer. I said, what do you think? He's calling me on the phone. He says, my professor is standing in front of me. I said, what do you think? He says, I don't know what to answer. I said, brother, think about it. Tell this professor, since we concocted that lying is bad, and speaking the truth is good, that's a moral argument, flip it. Let's stop it and let's reverse it. Let's make lying good and speaking the truth bad. Try it. No human being in the world will tell you that's a good thing. Why are we all bound by one way? Why is it that the promotion of good is always superior to evil? It's fixed. 
No evildoer can ever flip it the other way. Impossible. It's fixed. So this notion that we concocted or we created morality is a poison pill to confuse us. Among mankind are those who create frivolous talk to take us away from the path of Allah. We're all victims of these things. I know growing up people used to tell me those kinds of things. And then I would say, oh wow, he looks so smart. He's such a scientist. He's such a teacher. He must know something. Then I start getting confused. And then I start getting worried. And then I don't feel like praying because I'm worried. Why should I pray to this God? Maybe he doesn't exist. Why am I wasting my time? My friends are not praying. Why should I bother? My friends are having a good time. My friends are freely dating girls. Why shouldn't I do that? Let me just go and explore. Why should I limit myself with this religion that's telling me to be modest? Notice everything starts to break apart. Why? Because the minute there is doubt, there's no more a moral prescription. There's no more a reason to do good things. There's no more vision. It becomes very temporary then. You'll only do good if it suits you. That's very, very self-centered. And that's haram. An individual who should be focusing to bring positive attributes to the, in their society and themselves has to have the vision of Allah. Without the vision of Allah, you cannot accomplish, uh, you can, we cannot reach perfection, and we cannot accomplish good. So when people say, oh, morality is a creation of man, or oh, religion is a creation of man, it's not. People say, well, you know, I don't believe in religion. I say, what's your definition of religion? And most people don't know. You know that people say that. I don't believe in religion. I say, okay, define it. Uh, well, religion is, um... I say, you just don't believe in it. How can you not believe in something you don't even know what it means? How can you say, I don't believe in it, and you don't even know its meaning? But look how we just, you know, we just echo what's out there. The Dawkins, Richard Dawkins, you know, the God delusion mentality. We're just out there, we're thinking, okay, that's a scientist talking, let's just throw it out. Throw poison into the minds of people. And then what happens? We all start losing faith, we become a wild society, we start destroying each other, only to realize later, what did we just do? Oh, we missed the point. That's why the dhikr of Allah, فَذَكِّرْ إِنَّ فَعَتِ الذِّكْرَ Reminding is so beneficial that everything around us, Allah says, كُلَّ يَوْمٍ هُوَ فِي شَأْن Every day there is a sign. Why is it a sign? Allah says, remind yourself, remind yourself. There is a purpose in this life. Fulfill the obligation, you will benefit. So let's not fall prey into these poison pills, by the way. It's always fascinating to me when I'm even in academic institutions, and I even meet very, very learned professors who are atheistic. I sit with them and I see they're very good people, good-hearted, but totally confused. At this level, they are so confused that when I sit with them, I'm talking to them, I had a professor who was an atheist, I met him in Maryland. He says, I want to have a coffee with you. I said, sure, after my presentation. We went and had coffee. He's telling me about how the universe came. And I said, what's your definition? What's your definition of evil? He starts rambling. I said, you're a, and he's a professor of uh, philosophy at the school, PhD. I said, this is your perspective? Then when I asked him a few questions, and I, I brought a perspective from an Islamic point, he says, hmm, that's very interesting. I said, look at it. Can you, put, punk, punk, uh, can you poke a hole in it? Try it. And he's looking at me. He says, well, I need to think about it. I said, subhanAllah, even in academia, don't be fooled. Just because they're professors with PhDs doesn't mean they know the answers. They're just throwing stuff at us because that's what they've been trained to think. They're not perfect. There's no, none of these people, unless they're prophets and imams, they cannot. So, but we have to learn, what do I look for? What question do I ask? What basic formulation do I ask? Once you understand it, I tell you, even the most ardent atheist comes in front of you, they cannot touch you. Now what happens, the more they poke at you, the more they realize that you're rock solid, the more you're teaching them that, hey, you should come this way too. And the more you feel validated, vindicated, and strengthened, and your iman starts to grow. You start flying towards Allah. This is our imams were. They had so much certainty in Allah that when the enemies were taking them and killing them, they said, you have no idea how bad you people are and what you are doing. And we are your guide. But the doubt factor destroyed them. Even Umar ibn Sa'ad knew this is the imam. But he loved the material so much, he loved the prospect of becoming a governor. And he killed, and he killed, and he killed. I was watching the movie of the life of Mullah Sadra. You know, uh, uh, Shirazi. You find Mullah Sadra, the king of the time, here his son may want to kill him, but his son was innocent. So what does he do? He wants to kill him. 
He's so hungry for power. His son is so innocent, but he's so hungry for that seat and power. He can't, he can't let anybody get near it. Even his own son, he even, he even destroyed his father. So he says, my son may kill me. So I want you to kill him. So he's asking all his guards, go and kill him. None of them are, are accepting it. They said, no, we can't. We can't do this. This is the crown prince. This is going to destroy our generation. We can't. So what does he do? He hires a person from Syria who is one of his soldiers. He says, kill my son. I'll give you governorship. He says, governorship? He says, yeah, I'll give you governorship. He says, OK. He goes and he kills the son. Then the guy is arrested. The king says, yeah, this murderer, put him in prison. See, Allah says, look, you fool. You, you sold your soul. You killed an innocent life for governorship. Look what he did to you. He put you in prison. And then what did this king do? Unbelievable. This is the movie now. But the moral of the story. He says, you will go to prison. I will release you. But when I release you, go home and get your eldest son's head to me. This is shaitan now. Notice, once you go on a roll, you go. Because you lost sight of the vision. The material caught you. It became your goal. So he goes home after he's released, and he brings the head of his son. He says, here, you told me to bring here. So the king is looking at him, he says, you know how it feels now to lose your son? He says, yeah, I just wanted you to feel that. And what does that mean? He's become a butcher, a murderer, and he's destroyed, killed. So at the end, Allah says, look, in son, how foolish they are. They lost vision of what their purpose was in life. Look what happens to them. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. <clears throat> Historically, brothers and sisters, and I'm going to conclude tonight, I want us all to understand, and forgive me if I am, usually my last night, I can s stick on one subject and just finish that one subject and move on. But I think tying the loose ends sometimes is essential for us to get that feel, that the discussion of Karbala is proof of people who had faith in action. You and I must live a life that we achieve that quality where every day our transactions should lead us to have faith in action, strength. When shaitan comes in front of us, we said, no, I know the consequences. And I will not join you. I will not become like those who were given false promises and nothing was delivered to them. No, I will not be like that. I'm going to be firm. So our hijab, our Islam, our salah, our community, our friends, one of the biggest problems our community has is when we turn towards Allah, we lose friends, especially the kinds of friends we had where we did things in the wrong way. One of the biggest problems people have is losing friends. If I ever talk to our young brother and say, brother, you need to change, they say, I know. If you, if you look at them, one of the biggest things they're worried about is losing their friends. They're afraid that my friends, we hang out in those places. This is what we do at night. On weekends, we're busy playing Halo. In this place, we're busy doing this. Now you want me to stop. I'm going to lose my friends. What ends up happening is we are very resistant. We find a thousand excuses why it's wrong to give up. We resist. I had a young brother in Canada. He came to me. He was crying. He says, I have realized how wrong I am. I have realized how bad I am. And I'm in the wrong place. Alhamdulillah, so far, I have not done much haram. But I can see it's coming. All the opportunities are coming. And it's coming so fast at me that I'm going to have to jump in it full force. And I'm worried. But I'm realizing I'm wrong and I want to change. While he's talking to me, he says, I want to spend tonight discussing with you hundreds of questions. I said, no problem. I'm at your disposal. So we're sitting there. He's talking. His phone keeps ringing. And he would turn it off. He would look. He would turn it off. So after a few times, the phone rang. You could see he was agitated. He was not concentrating. He was not focused. I'm talking to him. You could see his mind is wandering. So I stop and I say, you're bothered. So that friend of yours is calling you. He looked at me and says, how do you know? I said, of course. That's the life, isn't it? He says, yeah, he's calling me. He's right now going to the club. He wants me to join him. And now I don't know what to do. I said, well, answer him. Tell him you're busy. He couldn't. He couldn't. Because you have to give him the excuse. And the friends are, what busy? Come on, we're going to do the greatest thing, you know? Come on, peer pressure. He was terrified just to answer. I said, wow, this is amazing. All you have to do is pick up the phone and say, I can't come today. Sorry, leave me alone. No, the loyalty. 
was so powerful, he had tears coming up. I said, you're that worried? He says, you have no idea how much we are committed to our friends. You have no idea, brother. I said, wow, this is a collection of events that has been forming into some solid uh, formation that's going to take you and sink you. We have to break this. So I showed him ways in which to fight it without burning bridges with friends. And now you choose your real friends. You'll find there will be those that will drop you. They won't talk to you. Because the minute they see you come towards Allah, they say, what? Like a sister, for example, I know. There's a sister in our community here. She was not wearing hijab. And by the way, hijab is a whole different discussion. We, I haven't spoken much about it, but you've got the gist yesterday when, with Lauren Booth and so on, alhamdulillah. And I recommend all sisters, please, hijab doesn't mean just this tight, 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 tight scarf and then tight, 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 tight clothes. Okay? It's a good start, alhamdulillah. But let's not say, wow, I'm such a muhajaba. Okay, no, there's a long way to go, please. It needs to get looser, okay? It needs to not show the shade, please. Because you have no idea how men are looking. And the worst thing, I have a daughter, I have a wife, I have parents, I have my mother. I remember as a child, as a child, I was only seven years old. My mother and I were walking and men were looking at my mother in the wrong way. I wanted to go and strangle them. I was only seven. That fitra that's built into us, haya. You look at your mother, says, how dare anybody looks at my mother in the wrong way. That's the haya. Let's not allow people, let's not give them that chance, please. Let's not give them the opportunity to come and, and destroy. The sister in our community, she was not wearing hijab, and she was going out and socializing, and she had a select group of friends. They used to go out to the, to the gym and work out and so on. She realized after a discussion, consecutive discussion, she says, it's an obligation. It's a flag. It's my dignity. It's my womanhood. And by the way, a sister here, there's a sister who's, who's outside of Islam, who's a Christian, who's been attending these lectures. She says to me the other day, she says, the hijab makes me complete as a woman. She's a Christian girl. She's not born a Muslim. Imagine, she's saying the hijab completes me. It makes me a complete woman. It gives me dignity. It gives me protection. I can feel my womanhood. In my experience, even when we went to a camp where the chief chef of the camp does shahada the last day without a word of Islam to him. He comes to me and says, Salam ala Muhammad wa Muhammad. I was, believe me, the youth, it is Allah showing us the rahmah, the ni'mah. Allah says, you take one step, I'll show you what it means. Your salah, I'll show you what it means. If you have doubts, do it. See how it responds. In that camp, this chief chef was a Greek person, says, I want to do shahada. I said, why? He said, I've been watching you women doing this weekend camp. I am impressed. This is womanhood. This is what I want my daughter to be like. I want her to follow this pathway, not that pathway. And then he pointed outside, there were some girls walking out with t-shirts. He says, not that, this one, this is what I want. I said, wow, shocking. I, mean, I never sat with him, never had a conversation about Islam. He says, I've been watching you guys. I've been watching you. I'm convinced you people have peace. You have security. I can see it. I want it. He did shahada. He prayed with us. He took his daughter, a nine-year-old girl, put a hijab on her. You know, we changed her name to Zainab. SubhanAllah, it was a beautiful relationship. Allah said, look, you took one step. You didn't even talk to them. It was your characteristic. This sister says, I want to become, I want to start wearing hijab. All her friends came after her, started calling her names. What's wrong with you? This, that. She says, my God, I never knew these people hated me so much. I said, notice when you brought Islam forward, their true colors showed up. Either they're jahil, they're ignorant, or they're really the enemies of Allah. But probably they're ignorant. They're not bad people. They're just ignorant. You need to guide them now. Don't burn bridges with them. Never say to them, listen, don't ever talk to me. No, never, never do that. لا تسأر خدك للناس ولا تمشي في الأرض مرحة. Don't ever turn your face away from the people. And don't walk exultingly on this earth. ولا تمشي في الأرض مرحة. إن الله لا يحب كل مختال فقول. Allah doesn't like people who are exulting show-offs. Allah doesn't like it. So I said to the sister, do that. She said, they all abandoned me. All of them. They wouldn't call me. If I call them, they don't call me back because I became a threat to them. And she started telling me with tears. She says, I haven't harmed them. I haven't stolen from them. All I am doing is putting hijab for myself. And it's bothering them. I said, notice how shaitan works. You know, this, uh, it's so obvious. If somebody comes and harms you and you don't like them, OK. I want to do good. I want to be a good person. Why do you hate me? Why don't you like me? 
Because when we do Allah's work, we are a reminder for everyone. And those who don't want to be reminded get annoyed. That's how it works. I say, but don't worry. Allah will replace you, your friends, with better ones. That's the law of Allah. And over time, there were a few months that passed. She was always alone. And you could see it. She was alone. I said, hold on to the rope. It's a trial. Allah is testing you. You're going to be lonely. Shaitan is going to play havoc with you. He's going to try to convince you you made a mistake. Just quit. Quit it now. I said, don't. Hold on. And in short time, she started getting friends. One friend, two friends. They were so pious, so good. Today, she says, I'll give my life for these friends. I have a few of them, but they are so precious to me that those friends I had plenty, they're no comparison to what I have. Allah says, I'm saying to her, I said, Allah has told you to, uh, Allah says, aflaha man zakka. The one who purifies is successful. You purified. Look how Allah replaced you with friends. Better friends, trustworthy friends, decent friends, the friends who don't backbite, friends who don't cheat you. Aren't you happier? She says, priceless. Priceless. What I had, I thought I was happy. I was all the time in the, in the malls buying stuff because I was not happy. I was a shopaholic. But now I am satisfied. I walk with dignity. I walk with tranquility. I said, look how fat your family, how happy your family looks. They all look so contented. I said, there's a cleansing moment. He said, yes. I said, then move forward. Don't be afraid. We have our imams as great role models that while the swords came to their necks, they didn't flinch. They did not move away. How about us when we claim to love them? Should we not do something like that? That's the key. Allah says we bought their souls. They fight, they, are, they slay, and they are killed. They kill and they get killed. Meaning here, if they are attacked, they rise, and they're not afraid. So let us go to Karbala, brothers and sisters, and you will see how Zainab uh, you will see that how she stood against the, the forces in, in, in an amazing uh, fashion. And you will see that uh, we need to hopefully um, follow that. Salaam ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Look what Zainab said. She's now, look at the history. Very quick, because I, I know some of you are coming here specifically because you love to listen to history, and we should. We should have a clear vision of history, brothers and sisters. History is the foundation of our security and our strength. We have to understand how it works. That's part of the thing. When we have scientific discussions about belief in Allah, that's one area. When we have proof about Quran in terms of hijab, you know, this Lauren Booth example I gave us, look at the power, the power of these young children. Lauren Booth's young children, not raised as Muslims, but their fitrah. He says, Mom, you will be decent. We love Islam. Islam is the religion of decency. That's the power. Let us be that and see the power. At the other level, it's the historical level. Let's know the history of our religion. Let's know the past. Let's understand what happened. Okay? You find that after Yazid, what did Yazid do? And this is history. What did Yazid do? Yazid came into power. No man in history has committed the level of crime against his own religion more than Yazid. No man in history. Three iconic symbols in Islam, and I'll spell them very quickly. First is Ahlul Bayt. The Quran, of course, is one. Ahlul Bayt, it's an iconic, it's, 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 it's the foundation of our deen. It's the usul al deen. The usul, brothers and sisters. Our usul is at that level. You find that the Ahlul Bayt is one, the Prophet's masjid, and his grave is another. As you notice, ask, look at any Muslim in the world, you'll find typically they have the green dome, picture of the Prophet's Masjid in their home somewhere. Okay, a typical Muslim. And you'll see that they have a picture of the Kaaba. Two images, typical. You go to Mecca, Medina, you go to any Muslim shop, you'll see somebody selling either the uh, little replica of the Kaaba or the Prophet's Masjid. You know, those are the symbols of the Muslims. Yazid attacked all three of them. The first one, the most important one, as we say, in the, in the living, was Imam Hussein al He attacked the Prophet. He killed the family. First year. That was the first year, 61 AH. 62 AH, with, no, it, actually within that same year, I think, within a span of three years, he attacked Medina. Why? Because after Yazid did this to Imam Hussein the people of Medina started to rise. 
What did Yazid do? Let me spell it very quickly so you understand, so we don't lose the focus. He took the, uh, uh, the prisoners, Imam Zal Abidin, Zainab alayhi salam, and the army took straight to Kufa. Why? Because Ibn Ziyad was the commander of the army, orchestrating as the governor. Umar ibn Sa'd was controlling the army in Karbala. Ibn Ziyad was giving instructions from Kufa. So the, the prisoners are taken first to Kufa. And that's the whole story of Zainab Alaihissalam entering Kufa, and people are lamenting as they see this uh, people coming because the people of Kufa recognized, they recognized Zainab Alaihissalam, they recognized Imam Zainab Alaihissalam. Because remember, Imam Ali Alaihissalam's uh, uh, central capital was in Kufa. He moved it from Medina to Kufa. So the Shia of Ali ibn Abi Talib were there. They recognized it, and they're lamenting. And Zainab Alaihissalam says, too late for you to lament. When my, when my brother called you, you were silent. When Ibn Ziyad was committing the crimes, you abandoned, you ran away. It's late. And the Imam starts speaking. So Ibn Ziyad notices that while Zainab is in, the, in, his, in his possession, and Imam Zainab Abidin and the, the prisoners are there, the people of Kufa became very uh, edgy. They started getting infuriated. If you see the movie, especially on Mukhtar Sakafi, which is the series is still working on, you see Mukhtar is placed in prison. They have this venom of revenge. They said, we are going to avenge the blood of Hussein ibn Ali. So the people started rising. There was this boldness now. We, you know, because before they thought Ibn Ziyad won't go that far. When he went that far, they said, OK, enough. So the people of Kufa started to rise. So Ibn Ziyad realized, if these people stay here long enough, there's going to be mutiny. So he immediately takes the, his army under Khuli. Khuli was one of the persons who fought in, uh, in Karbala and Shamr and his army and says immediately dispatch the head of Hussein and the prisoners and all the heads take them to Yazid. So they start moving from Kufa to Damascus. But what, they, what did they do? They started taking all the main roads in order to parade them. And what they realized, the army was so drunk in power thinking that by showing off these prisoners, the people will be subdued and they'll be afraid of, the, of, of Yazid. Rather, when people realized who the head was, and they realized Imam Zainul Abidin, and there's a story after story, even Christian monks, when they recognized the head of Imam Hussein, they, re they rebelled against Yazid's army. Imagine, when they realized this is Imam Hussein, the grandson of the Prophet, even they rebelled. So the rebellion started basically by exposing Ahlul Bayt to the public. People realized this crime, the rebellion started, the spirit of rebellion started. So the army started moving faster because they knew if they stood someplace, people knew the story because what happened, it's a catch-22. You want to show off that these were rebels, meaning Ahlul Bayt were rebels to Yazid. So people ask, who are these rebels? Then the Imam is there, he is talking. They're seeing the akhlaq of these people. They're seeing these women with light on their faces. They said, who are these people that we killed, that our caliph killed? Who are these people? The more people realized, the more they came inclined towards Ahlul Bayt. So it became a, a strategy. So that while the imam is going, you find the people's hearts are already starting to rise. So the revolution started. As you know, when Zainab salam and Imam Zainab Abidin enters the Mishk, for the first time, Ahl al-Bayt are present there to talk to the people of Syria. Because remember, prior to that, Muawiyah was controlling the minds of his people. And he polluted their minds against Ahl al-Bayt until today. You go to Syria, you see that presence of the Umayyad. You can sense it. You feel that atrocity that was committed. It's still present. You can sense the energy. Because that's how the Umayyad echoes were, how powerful they were. Now the Imam is going to shatter that. Zainab is going to shatter it. So what, does ha what happens? The people start revolting. First thing they do is they revolt in Medina. Yazid sends his army to counter Medina. Because remember, Medina is the center of Islam. That's where the Prophet was. And that revolution, if it rises, will destroy Yazid's position. So he sends an army. And Yazid gives the command to his army and says, kill anybody who, st who stands against you. And they say they butchered, they massacred Medina. They said so many of the uh, Sahab of the Prophet even were killed. So many were killed because they rose against Yazid. To the point where the, the masjid of the Messenger of Allah was empty. Historians say dogs were running in the masjid. And who sat on the pulpit of the Prophet? Monkeys. Yazid sent monkeys to sit up there. So the second thing he did, he desecrated the Prophet's mosque. You and I, when we go to the masjid of Nabi, I tell you it is so sacred. 
There's some energy there you will never find anywhere in the world. There's something unique with the Prophet's grave is there. The third year, what happens? People rise in Mecca also. Now Abdullah ibn Zubair was also doing a revolt in Mecca wanting to take power. So Yazid sends an army to counter that. So while on the hills, Yazid's army is throwing fireballs at the Kaaba because they're fighting Ibn Zubair. And what you find is the Kaaba catches fire. So three things. He killed Imam Hussein, desecrated the uh, Prophet's masjid, mosque in his grave, and the Kaaba. You cannot find a human being in a span of three years who committed this level of crime. And the gravity of the crime is second to none historically. And within three years plus, Yazid died, gone. He went hunting, his body came back cut to pieces on a horse, no one knows how he was killed. Buried, no one knows where he's buried. Now, let's go to the history of Zainab Alaysam. She's now standing in this palace. Seven Adhan, Imam Zainab al Abidin is standing outside, he's a young man under the sun. By the way, they say the prison even, the prison that they were placed in in, uh, in Damascus had no roof. It had no roof. At night, it was freezing cold. During the day, it was extremely hot. That's how they lived in this, in this prison. While, before they enter this prison, <clears throat> while they're coming in with chains, they're standing at the gates, Yazid had the whole city embellished, you know, with uh, all kinds of colorful, you know, uh, he just made the whole city very merry, merry looking. That's why today, until today, in Maghrib, you go to Morocco, you go to even certain parts of Egypt, other parts, people celebrate, they give candy, they, they congratulate each other. That's the echoes of the Bani Umayyah. That started in Syria, and the people caught on, you see, because the Caliph, remember, was in Syria at that time. Uh, Yazid and Muawiyah in Syria. So it expanded from there. So when we look in the world today, the Muslim world, we see wrong things happening. We say, how come people are doing wrong? It's logical. When you have your headquarters doing something wrong, you're going to adopt it. You're going to think this is religion. And that's why we have so much wrong today. So Imam Zain al-Abidin is entering, and an old man says, it's good that our Amir al-Mu'mineen killed you. It is good. And Imam looks at him and does not get angry. Now the real mission starts. Now the media of Imam Hussein is in full action now. It's penetrating into the heart of Yazid and it's going to destroy him now. The, he has made a major mistake. You don't mess with Allah. Even Musa salam, when Fir'aun tried to mess with him, Allah sent him to his house and said, you will raise him. You want to kill every firstborn? Kill them. I will send the one who will destroy you that you're trying to destroy you will raise him. That's the insult. No one messes with Allah. So you find Imam Zayn al-Abidin is looking at the man and he says, have you read the ayahs of the, you read the Quran? He said, yes. He said, have you read, قُلْ لَا أَسْأَلْكُمْ عَلَيْهِ أَجْرًا إِلَّا الْمَوَدَّةَ فِي الْقُرْبَى He said, yes, I have read that. He said, who is the Qurba if not us? We are the Qurba. I am the grandson of the Prophet. She is the granddaughter of the Prophet. We are from the daughter of the Prophet. We are the Qurba. Have you not read the ayah, إِنَّمَا يُرِيدُ اللَّهُ لِيُذْهِبَ عَنْكُمُ الرِّدْسَ أَحْلَ الْبَيْتِ وَيُتَحِرَكُمْ تَطِيرًا He said, yes, I have read that. He says, who is Ahl al-Bayt if not us? And this man began to realize, wow, I have been lied to. And he begins to cry. And he puts his face on the ground. He says, step on my face. This is one hadith that I read. He says, I am so embarrassed for what I said. Oh, the son of the prophet. I am so embarrassed for this accusation. How will you forgive me? Imam says, it's OK. It's OK. You were misinformed. And that's how the media of Imam, Imam Hussain started. Now, Zainab salam enters the court. The, all the, the uh, Yazid was drunk, sitting on the throne. Drunk, and the head of Imam Hussain is brought, and he's taking the stick and he's hitting it and playing with the teeth. Historians say even Zayd ibn Arqam was so infuriated with that. He says, How dare you? He said to Ibn Ziyad, How dare you touch the lips? I saw with my own eyes those lips being kissed by the Messenger of Allah. How dare you touch that? How dare you hit it this way? People got animated. Because it was a sacred thing. And imagine Imam's head being brought on a plate. That vision, unbelievable vision. So Yazid is drunk now, and he's, he's sitting on the throne. And all the, his court people are there. And he's even got ambassadors from other countries. There was an ambassador from, uh, from Byzantium who came, the Roman ambassador. Even he was there. Imagine, 
Christian ambassador. He's there now, Yazid is parading. He's showing the world, look how mighty I am. Now watch what Zainab She looks at him, she's in chair. They are all the women now gathered in front of Yazid. She starts, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. All praise is due to Allah, Lord of the worlds. Blessings of Allah be upon his Rasul and his entire progeny. Allah's words are true, who say, then, this is an ayah of the Quran, then the end of those who committed evil was that they disbelieved in the signs of Allah and they were insulting them. She's addressing Yazid now. She says, oh Yazid. She, does, she doesn't say this, she says, do you think that you have blocked all opportunities on earth and the scope of the universe for us and driven us as prisoners and assumed that we have been degraded in the sight of Allah and that you are respectful in his eyes and have acquired an important and lofty position near Allah due to this and now have the impunity to look down upon us and become arrogant, jubilant when you see the world has turned towards you? Are you happy now that the world is in your hands? She's basically saying, you presume that your task is planned. Why? Because remember, they believed in predestination. Yazid was promoting predestination. He says, while your power and command pleases you, have you forgotten the words of Allah? Do not regard those who disbelieve, this is, I'm translating, that we grant them good for themselves. This is an ayah in the Quran. We only give them a chance so that they may increase in their sins. Meaning Allah gave Yazid a chance as a punishment. It wasn't a reward. Allah says we allow them this power to increase them in their sins. That means Allah has already condemned them. And for them, there is a humiliating and disgraceful torment awaiting them. She's telling this to Yazid. Imagine, just take the scenario. Here's a man who can just have your head cut off. And she's reciting like this. And the crowd is silent. And Zainab salam is talking. She says, listen to the next sentence. Is it the custom of justice? Oh, a cursed son of a freed slave. That you keep your ladies and concubines, their harem, behind the veils with respect. And at the same time, you captivate and parade the helpless daughters of the Holy Prophet as prisoners. You snatch their veils and expose their faces and display them from one land to another, being viewed by those at watering places as well as those who guarded their forts, while their faces exposed to the looks of everyone, near or distinct, low or elite, having none of their men with them, nor any of their protectors. How dare, she's saying, you expose us while you protect your women. Historians say the wife of Yazid was behind the veil. She saw Imam, uh, I mean, uh, Zainab salam standing there. And she was so disturbed to see how she was. She took her veil and came immediately and handed it over to Zainab salam. Some historians say, what can be expected from, from the one descended from those whose mouths chewed the liver of the purified ones and whose flesh grows out of the blood of the shuhada. Look at the comment. She's saying, your mother ate the liver of Hamza. In your generation, flesh comes out of the blood of the shuhada, meaning you are venomous killers. This is how Zainab was talking. Now imagine, he's the caliph. You have to understand, this is like the pharaoh sitting on the throne and somebody's talking to them like that. You just cannot do that. This was the might of Zainab The power and the might was so incredible, it's, it goes beyond description. The, she continues, by the way, in the end, I'll just paraphrase, she says, it's okay. And she now they say, historians say, she was tears coming out the way she said it, her voice started to tremble. She says, it's okay, you cut our limbs. You killed us, but we see nothing but grace from God. And the people were stunned. She's bringing Iman to the people of Syria. She's bringing Iman. So the ambassador, the Christian ambassador, he asks Yazid, who is this man? He says, that's the grandson of the Prophet. He says, but you are the Khalifa of the very religion of the Prophet. He said, yes, he rebelled against me. He did not obey me. And the Christian man says, for us, whatever Jesus touched became sacred. You go and you destroy the very one that kissed his lips? 
This man became so infuriated, this ambassador became so infuriated, he comes towards the head of Imam Hussein and he hugs it. And Yazid gets so furious because he sees that, wow, even the Christian has become a Muslim now in the court of Yazid. He did his shahada right there. I bear witness that this is the religion of truth for a man who has given his life as such that Yazid has him immediately killed. So he becomes shaheed in front. Now more shuhada start coming out. You notice people are getting infused. This is what happened in Karbala. There's plenty to say. I don't have too much time, but I hope you get the gist. I'd like to conclude that Islam is the religion of modesty and all that has happened in history until today continues to grow. The shahada of Imam Hussein lies in the hearts of all believers and non-believers. Today I was reading an article by a brother who comes from a different school of thought on the it's almadinainstitute.org. He's a brother who's written a whole article on the power of Imam Hussein. He's not a follower, in other words, he's not a Shia. I don't like to use this word Shias and Sunnis, but he's from the Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah. You find he says, all of us as Muslims must remember Karbala, for even Imam Shafi has told us that if you don't love Ahl al Bayt and you don't remember them, your, your, your salah is bottled. Imagine, Imam Shafi says that. He says that we must remember Karbala, we must keep it alive. And I was reading this article, I had tears in my eyes. I said, SubhanAllah, the power of Imam Hussein, it penetrates even the hearts of people out there who have not heard Karbala. I know our brothers and sisters in our communities of different schools of thought, some of them have never heard about Karbala. They've never heard about Imam Hussein. If you go to Morocco and Egypt and those places, yeah, people haven't heard it, but now it's growing. I understand a brother from Egypt, right here in our community told me, he said, first time in Egypt, it was a public commemoration for the shahad of Imam Hussein. It's growing, it's coming out. People are realizing the truth is coming out. The world is becoming aware. The world is reading the Quran. It's on the bestsellers list. Islam is growing rapidly, brothers and sisters. I believe Imam Mahdi alayhi salatu wasalam, inshallah, is going to reappear soon for us. And even if he does not in our lifetime, inshallah he will. But even if he does not, let us prepare the way. Let us take this shahad of Imam Hussein. Let us take this quality of Imam Zain al-Abidin. His patience was impeccable. Look at what Imam Zain al-Abidin, he left us with Sahih al sajjadi I conclude on this. He left us with Sahih al sajjadi this book. Please, brothers and sisters, read some of it. Look at what Imam Zain al-Abidin has left us with. Look at this. Dua makarim al-akhlaq. This dua is highly recommended to read. I give you a little story. I had a group of youth that I was working with in New York. I've been dealing with kids for a long time. And these were teenage youth. They came to me, they used to pray. I was shocked, I was very surprised. I never even told them this. But they were so impressed with Islam, they started doing Salatul Layl. This boy, there's a boy who came with us on a ski trip. And his parents are very wealthy, and, but they were not religious at all. And his friend said, look, we're going on a ski trip. Uh, why don't you join us? He said, yeah, ski trip, I'll come. He came, it was a weekend ski trip. And I used to teach the kids to ski. So he came. And we don't preach Islam. We practice it, we just live it. No foul language, we pray together, we discuss any questions, but we don't preach. So this boy is watching us, and he joined us in prayers. He wrote me a long letter after this three-day camp. He says, I never knew that this is Islam. I came skiing with you. I thought it's just a ski trip. It was the best time of my life. I had a great time physically, and I had a great time spiritually. SubhanAllah, look how people change. So I visited his home one day, so he left us, we were having dinner, and then after a while he left us. So I said to the father, where is he going? He says, don't worry, he didn't go to sleep. I said, why? It's midnight. He says, no, you want to see, come. So he takes me to his room, he opens the door, he says, look, the son was praying Salatul Layl. And he's not telling anybody, secret, I didn't even know. These are the kind of youth that we're, ca we're capable of bringing into society. Today he's a physician, he's a surgeon, he's a contributor, he guides people, he's teaching people, he's become a great, uh, solace for his community. What a na'mah, one child who was lost, came on one trip, his life changed. He saw something, he came towards it. This group of youth came to me and they said, brother, how can we get closer to Allah that our character changes? Because we have character flaws. I said, read Dua Makarim Al-Akhlaq. Number 20 in Saif al sajjadiyah Dua Makarim Al-Akhlaq, read it, it's good for you. So they said, can you help us? We sat down one day in somebody's house and I recited it, and I translated it. It's a long du'a, you don't have to read the whole thing. I said, read it. I just recommend it. About 
eight, nine months later, I was in the masjid and I look at them and they look different. Just they were glowing. But I, did, I, I thought maybe I'm just seeing things. A brother comes to me and says, those youth who are always with you, wow, they're so special. I said, what do you mean? I said, he said, their character is just magnetic. We just want to be next to them. We just love to be friends with them. What are they doing? I said, you know, to be honest with you, I don't know. So I sat with them and I said to them, people are saying that you look special. I also see it. I see something about you that's magnetic. They smiled, they said, look, we don't want to tell you, but we've been reading Dua Makarim al Akhlaq every week. Together, we get together and we read Dua Makarim al Akhlaq. And we notice our character with our parents has changed. We've become gentler, we become wiser, we hold our tongue better, we don't use foul language, we're gentle, we're patient. I said, SubhanAllah, look at the dua. Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa ali wa ballig bi imani akmal al iman waj'al yaqini afdal al yaqeen wantahi bi niyati ila ahsan al niyat wa bi amali ila ahsan al a'mal. Beginning of this dua, Imam Zainal Abidin wrote this. When? After the shahada of the Imam. He wrote this for us and it was preserved for us. You know, this book now is officially recognized in even Saudi Arabia as a book to be printed for the good of mankind. SubhanAllah. He says, oh Allah, bless Muhammad and his household. Cause my faith to reach the most perfect faith and make my certainty the most excellent certainty and take my intention to the best of intentions and my works to the best of works. This is how it starts. The dua is long. Talks about parents, talks about brothers, talks about neighbors, talks about the self. Each section it appears. I leave us all tonight with dua. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ad'uni astajib lakum. Ask me, I answer you. We have problems. And our problems can be solved if we sincerely go to sujoon. In my life, I say it. Allah has never denied me my prayers. And I know he will never deny, and he has not denied your prayers either. Allah never denies anybody's prayers. Please, let's seek. Let's get it. We will change, and then we will be strong, and our iman will be better for us. Uh, may Allah bless.